as I was preparing this week, I was wanting to, I was thinking, you know, what's, what should I do next? You know, what should I teach on next? What, Lord, I was praying, Lord, you know, where do you want me to just preach on this upcoming Sunday? And, you know, one of the things that I guess came to me, um, I believe, again, it was from the Lord, is we're quickly approaching these next two holidays that are coming up, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, Thanksgiving is what, in about a week and a half, two weeks almost, and then Christmas is is about a month after that. And uh, even New Year's, everything is, yeah, this year has gone by quick. Um, but what tends to happen is that there's so many, so many things going on, not just in our own personal lives, but in the, we also see things going on the, around the world that tend to really lose focus on things that really are important, the things that really matter get uh, so consumed with the issues we're having, maybe the health issues or the family issues or the traveling issues or even we just finished having an, an election and a lot of people are, are unhappy. Um, you know, a lot of people are unhappy with, you know, uh, the way the economy has been going. So the direction the Lord led me this week is you know, to really go back to something very important. And that's keeping our focus right. Developing or maintaining an eternal perspective on things in spite of what's going on in the world around us or just in our own homes. I heard a I once heard an interesting statistic. I don't have the numbers, but you know, they told me at work. Um, but these holiday these holidays um, are, I guess, the rate of suicides are the highest during these months, and it's sad. It's sad, uh, you know, that people have to get to that point where they're. I know a lot of it has to do with mental issues, and but again, I think that if many of them just have the right perspective, have the right focus, I think they could easily snap out of those those really depressive, severe depressive states. Again, I'm not putting a blanket on it all. I know again that. Um, there is mental health issues out there. I suffer through them. Um, and, and I know it could be, it could be tough, a tough time. But what I decided to do today is I'm gonna, we're going to be going through some of the words of Jesus. We're going to be reading what Jesus had to say about being ready. Being ready for his coming when he comes back. And so I've titled today's message, Are You Ready? And I'll be reading from Luke chapter 12 this morning. And while you turn there, if you have your Bibles, there's a few things I want to also preface before I get started. In Matthew chapter 6, our Lord Jesus taught us that we shouldn't be anxious about tomorrow. But it, he didn't teach us that we should ignore tomorrow. In fact, in fact, to the contrary, Jesus taught that our view of the future ought to be an important factor in how we should live today. As followers of Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we should think often about the fact that he's coming soon. And that every person, whether they're believers or not, will stand before him to give an account. So we should view ourselves as Christians, as stewards who've been entrusted 
with time, money, and abilities which, are, which we are to use for our master's kingdom. At some time, we don't know when, but we do know that it's certain, our Lord will return. And we must give an account of how we used what he gave us. Now, since I'll be picking up in the middle of chapter 12, um, let me just uh, let you know what has been going, what's been going on from since that point. And, you know, Jesus has been teaching. He's been talking about uh, um, being careful, telling his disciples, his followers, to be aware of uh, religious hypocrisy, the importance of fearing God, taking care of having the right perspective, acknowledging Christ. He also talks about anxiety. We shouldn't be anxious, you know, um, just trust in the Lord. And so he, tells, he also tells his disciples to seek, to seek the kingdom. And well, now he will go on to tell them to be ready for his return. Our passage today, in our passage today, it's going to be broken up into two parts. The theme of the first part is readiness, readiness for his coming. We will be looking into how to prepare ourselves for that time and the audit attitude that we ought to have. And the idea of the second part will show us that when the Lord comes, he will judge everyone according to what they've done, again, with what they've been given. And so the message today will be an exhortation to us to be ready for his return. Because when he comes, he will judge everyone. So before we get into our first part of our reading today, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak powerfully to us this morning. Lord, and you are great. You are awesome. You are so wonderful. So now as we open up your word, I pray that you will speak to each and every person that's sitting here today. Each and every person that's watching this message live or hearing it later on or watching it later on. I pray you will remind them or let them know that you are coming soon that your promises of coming back are not empty. Remind us, Lord, the importance of being ready to be, of being vigilant, being watchful, especially during this time that when our minds and hearts are so consumed with other things, they could be consumed with other things. Help us to have that eternal perspective, Lord God. Help us to really see what really matters. To see that one day all this will be gone. We will be living with you for all of eternity. So now fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Remove all distractions. Keep us all safe here, Lord. And may you bless this time tremendously. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right, Luke chapter 12. I'll be in verse 35. The Word of God says, Be ready for service and have your lamps lit. You are to be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding, from the wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will get ready. Have them recline at the table, then come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night, or even near dawn, and finds them alert, blessed are those servants. And know this, 
If the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. March 11th, 1942, on a corregidor, a 62-year-old army officer with his family secretly slipped away from the Philippines and in a minor miracle made their way down to Australia. Before General MacArthur left the islands, he said, I will return. Two and a half years later, October 20th, 1944, he stood again on the soil of the Philippines and said, this is the voice of freedom. People of the Philippines, I have returned. Now, if you think a man can have that kind of credibility, and if you can appreciate that quality in a man, I'll tell you that Jesus Christ, the God-man, has made the same promise far more credible than any human being will ever be. If you wrestle with the truth of Jesus' return, wrestle no longer. If you accept and if you believe the historic fact of his ascension, then you have no room to doubt his historic yet future return. It will, my friends, occur. Well, in the passage we just read, Jesus tells us how, how we ought to prepare and, again, the attitude we ought to have for his return. So now, here, in order for his disciples to develop an eternal perspective, Jesus offered three illustrations to encourage them to be ready and faithful. In the first illustration, he uses a parable to let the disciples know that they're to be like servants ready for service with their lamps lit, prepared for the master to return. How? Well, verses 36 through 38, in, the, in those verses, those servants were to do three things. First, or they are... They, they, they are to do three things. First, they have a duty to wait for the master to return from the wedding banquet. And she, just to give you a little bit of background, because Jewish weddings were traditionally held at night, it was the duty of the bridegroom's servants to wait for their master to come home with his bride. Secondly, those servants, they have a responsibility of staying alert so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door at once. You see, it isn't a matter of if he'll return, but when. And the last thing that new husband would want is to be waiting outside of his locked home with his new bride. Last thing, they're, they're challenged to be ready, day or night, for his return. Now, in the New Living Translation, verse 37 reads, Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. In other words, the bridegroom's servants were not to be caught off guard or unprepared to receive this new married couple. Now, I could also tell you this. These first few verses, they really do encourage me. <clears throat> and I think they really ought to be an encouragement to you as well. Why is that? Because Jesus here doesn't say, blessed are those servants who, when the Lord comes, he shall find working, witnessing, praying, preaching, studying, or serving. No. What does he say there? Blessed. 
will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Church, there's a lot of people out there who are just so distracted with the problems of their own lives or the problems of the lives of others that they lost focus, focus on Christ's return. See, when people live their lives apart from him, it becomes easier to be consumed, to be consumed in the here and now rather than the blessings that are to come. But if you're more heavenly minded than earthly minded and are eagerly awaiting for, for his return, blessed are you. Let me put it another way. If you're in the midst of a divorce, if struggling with and struggling with the finances, you don't know where if you're going to be able to pay the mortgage, the rent, the bills, or you're dealing with the uncomfort or the physical pain of these temporal bodies, blessed are you because you know that all of this is passing away. And you know and you're looking forward to what lies ahead. You're looking forward to that eternal home, that eternal dwelling that's waiting for us. You're looking forward to heaven. Blessed are you for not allowing the distractions of this life keep you from your duty to wait, your responsibility of staying alert, and the challenge of being ready at all times. I notice also what it will be like for those whom the master finds ready. Verses 37 and 38 reveal that there isn't any barking commands, no extra burden of work. Instead, it's a role reversal. We see the servants reclining at the table to eat as a master puts on the servants' clothes, prepares the food, and serves them. Friends, our king will minister to his faithful servants when he greets us at his return. And he will reward us for our faithfulness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that alone, that thought alone of Jesus serving us, it's a beautiful reward. It's a beautiful reward that we're gonna, that we're gonna get just for waiting, for being alert, for being vigilant, for being ready for his return. So now let me ask, ask this question. Why, in John 13, did Jesus wash feet and serve his disciples? Why, in John 21, did he cook fish and feed them? Why does Jesus bless those who are simply looking for his coming? Let me tell you. Because those whom the Lord serves realize grace has nothing to do with who they are and everything to do with who he is. Those whom the Lord serves understand it's no longer due to their greatness, but solely to his graciousness that they are blessed. They also understand that it's not based upon anything they They've, um, they've done or haven't done, but completely upon 
what he did on the cross. When he died for their sins. Now, then after this, he gives that second illustration. Second illustration is given of a homeowner and a thief that is meant to encourage readiness. Now, apparently a thief had broken into the house of the homeowner. But rather than making the lesson about the thief, Jesus flips it around. He says that if the homeowner had known the time, that the, at the time, had known the time the thief was coming, he would have prepared for the break-in. See, here, he, here he's admonishing his current followers, the followers he had at the time, as well as those who choose to follow him now, to be in constant readiness. So the idea is that Christ, the Son of Man, is coming back just as unexpectedly as the thief came to break in and rob the house. This is something that Paul also knew when he wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 2, the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. All of us should know, common sense, that a thief never announces his coming. He comes at a time when you don't expect it. But if you want to outsmart a smart thief, you have to guard, you have to be on guard, and you always have to be ready. You always, you got to prepare yourself. You got to take preventative measures. Likewise, the way to be ready for Jesus' return is to be, to live in constant readiness. To make those preventative measures, take those preventative measures. To prepare yourself fully in case that thief or in case Jesus comes. Now, let me also say this. There are those who say that Jesus cannot come back this hour because the church hasn't yet gone through the tribulation as described in Revelation chapter 6 verse 19. But I challenge this because Jesus in this passage, was telling his disciples to watch, to be constantly alert for the possibility of his coming at any time they did not expect it. If, on the other hand, the church were indeed to go, were indeed to go through the tribulation, we would know precisely the hour of his coming, exactly 1,260 days after the day the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple, Jewish temple, and demands to be worshipped. Thus, his coming wouldn't be at an hour we think not. So I believe one of the keys to overcoming hypo hypocrisy and covetousness is to live in constant anticipation that today could be the day Jesus comes back. Are you ready? Are you living that way? Are you living the life, your life right now, as hard as it may be, as difficult and challenging as it may be? Are you ready if Jesus was to come back? You know, we all are anticipating a time when he will come and rapture the church. And we will all be with him, waiting in heaven for him to make his final triumphant return. 
I don't know. I wouldn't want to be caught with my pants down figuratively. You know? I want to be known as a person that's being watchful. That is being vigilant. So are you living that way? I'm not saying like, again, that you have to be always looking at the sky. No, live your life. But live it in a way that honors the Lord. Live it in obedience to Christ. Are you reading his words and obeying them? Are you following him? You must be ready. It can happen at any time. Now, the next part of reading, the last part of a reading is the third illustration that we're going to be talking about. So, Let's go there now. We pick it up in verse 41. Luke chapter 12, verse 41. Lord, Peter asked, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible manager his master will put in charge of his household's household servants, to give them their allotted food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and starts to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and get drunk, that servant's master will come on a day when he does not expect him at a, at a, and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself or do it, he will be severely beaten. But the one who did not know and did what what a deserved punishment will receive a light beating. For everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. The third illustration encouraging readiness was prompted by Peter's question as to who this, that parable was for. As you can see there, Jesus didn't really answer Peter directly, which is to say the teaching is for anyone who understands it and applies it. But instead, Jesus introduced another parable by means of a question. Who then is the faithful and sensible manager? The positive answer is the faithful one who is given a task, who performs the task, and who is therefore blessed by the master. The reward Jesus mentioned here, put him in charge of all his possessions, is a hyperbolic expression. What he's implying by this was that the reward will be far greater than the challenges and hazards encountered in his temporal service. <coughs> all the apostles, all of them, had a special responsibility to feed God's household, his church. But as Christians, as believers today, each of us, each and every single one of you has a task also. You all have a task in this world assigned to us by Jesus himself. Our responsibility is to be faithful by accepting the task, performing the task 
and completing the task by the time he returns. So even though we may not appear, we, uh, may not appear successful in our own eyes or in the eyes of others, it doesn't really matter. That's not important. The thing God wants more than anything is faithfulness. If he's given you a task, if he's called you to do something, to go somewhere, are you being faithful to that? No matter how crazy it may sound. Now, again, you have to use discernment. You've got to be careful with that too. But are you performing the task? And are you trying to doing your best to complete it? I believe that when the Lord calls you home, whether it's by rapture or through death, it means that your task, if you've been doing it, has been complete. Even if it seems that it hasn't been, even if it seems that there was still so much left you could, that you wanted to do, no. When the Lord calls you home, he calls you home and says, you know what? It's, you're done. That's all I've called you to do is just to do that. But again, we have that responsibility to share the gospel, whether it's through one of the ministries, an outside parachurch military, parachurch uh, ministry, whether it's being going out to the mission field, maybe it's teaching, preaching the, the, the Bible on a pulpit. If you know what that calling is, and you're scared to take that first step, talk to somebody so they can pray with you, so they can guide you, counsel you. But do it. Take that step of faith. And the Lord, the Lord will open up those doors if that's your calling, if that's what he wants you to do. He will open up those doors. Now, that was the positive answer again. Uh, the negative answer to the question is the unfaithful and foolish slave who assumes the master's delay will continue indefinitely. Well, while in his false sense of security, he abuses the other servants and chooses to eat and drink and get drunk. However, when the Lord comes back, he will expose the foolishness of that servant's false assumptions and his false sense of security. The punishment will be that the master will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. Now, my point is this. The point is this. Listen carefully. This is about fake discipleship. Discipleship without dedication, true dedication to Jesus. That kind of fake discipleship, it doesn't fool the Lord. You can't fool God. You can't fool Jesus. He can see right through the heart. The servant who is unprepared for the master's return will find himself suffering the same punishment than any unfaithful servant will endure. And again, let me clarify, fake discipleship are those who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and they do the things, come to church, they pick up their Bibles, they mouth the lyrics to the worship songs, maybe they go to Bible study on Wednesdays, I'm not, again, I'm just saying in general. Um, they help out with the church. 
but there isn't really any true dedication. There is no change in their heart. Lord knows, again, that's why every time at the end of each service, I say, you know, I tell those who are watching and listening to pray this prayer with sincerity. Like they really mean it. Because it's easy just to say a prayer to, and think that you got their bases covered. You got your insurance plan. But Jesus knows the heart. And he knows if someone is praying that with all sincerity or not. He wants dedication. He wants your heart. He wants your life. He wants to change it. He wants to transform it. You have to allow him to do that. It's the only way. You can't fool God. Those who are just praying, just to praying, just to pray that prayer without real true sincerity or true repentance. Really, they're no different than someone who's just unfaithful, someone that's just of the world, someone that just isn't truly a believer. Now, to conclude his parable, Jesus then pictured two cases of unprepared servants, a willful one and an unwillful one, in verses 47 and 48. The willfully unprepared servant who knew his master's will was severely beaten, but the ignorantly unprepared servant received a light beating. The principal lesson here is that the more one is given, the more, more will be required from them. And the more one is entrusted with, even more will be expected. So simply put, the more you have, the greater the responsibility. This means that those who knew how to be ready, those who understood that they needed to be ready for his return, for Jesus' return, and yet weren't, will be punished worse than those who didn't know and weren't ready. Regardless, though, here's what I want you to understand. We have a God that is fair and just. I don't want you to be going around and start judging people and saying, you know, you're going to get the light beating, you're going to get the, you know, the, the severe beating. No, that's not, the, that's not what is, is going on here. That's not what it's saying here. It's just God is just. Leave it up to him. He will be fair. He will hold everyone, even you, who are judging others, accountable for the things you knew that you had to do but didn't do. When I found out about that and I discovered that, scared me to pieces because I know the things the Lord wants me to do. He's entrusted me many things entrusted me with a wife, a daughter. My two boys are gone now, but when they were leaving the house to, to watch over them, to protect them, to provide for them. He's entrusted me with a job where a lot, you know, there's a lot 
to that as well. Um, but he's also entrusted me with this responsibility of coming up here, opening up his word, reading it to you, and sharing with all of you what he's saying. And not deviate, not go off on some tangent, not to, and not to misinterpret, not to give my own interpretation. To tell you what it says and to explain it to you to the best of my knowledge, the best of my ability. I know I don't always do it right. I know I don't always, I'm not perfect. My wife was pointing out last week that I messed up on some names again last week. Um, but again, the Lord's not going to, I know that the Lord's not going to punish me for that. I know that he knows my heart. And maybe some of you do too. I'm, I'm grateful that you guys have patience with me when you do notice I've made a mistake. You know, and haven't rushed to kind of just start pointing the finger and, hey, you messed up. You know, it hasn't happened to me yet in these six years. I've been told, hey, you know, you messed up on the verse. And I, I try to be careful, more careful on that. But again, everyone will be judged with what you know and what you did with it. Do you really know the gospel? Do you really know what Jesus did on the cross for you? And you get to heaven, and you stand before God in his judgment seat. When you stand before Jesus, he's going to judge you. And you're not going to be able to hide it from him. He's going to tell you, hey, you knew you didn't need to live your life accordingly. And I wouldn't want to be part of that kind of judgment, that severe beating. Does it mean that I, I, I truly believe the Bible tells us that, that we're all going to be saved? Every person that truly believes or truly prays that prayer and repents and trusts Jesus it will be saved. But man, we're all going to go through, even Christians will go through a judgment. And I, I hope that you have that same mindset that I have. I get up there. When you get up there, you just want to be, Lord, I, I did my best with what you gave me, with what I knew. I know it wasn't perfect, and I messed up a lot, but it was all because of you. Give you the honor and glory. Now, in no way was Jesus also saying here that there are several classes of Christians, like genuine, committed ones, or carnal ones, or mere professing ones. Nor was he speaking about the issue of salvation. The principal issue in the parable was nothing other than faithfulness and is meant to point out that managers and servants will either be faithful or they're not. Here Jesus wasn't giving the disciples a way to test their genuineness or to assure themselves of salvation or eternal awards, rewards. Rather, just as the faithful servants in the parable expected the master to return, Jesus' our, Jesus' disciples, us, believers, Christians, we must live with the expectation that he too will return. So what he wanted them to learn from this parable was that if they lived expecting his return, they'll be found faithful and their faithfulness will be rewarded. However, if they live with callous disregard, they'll be found unfaithful and they should expect the punishment to be severe. So now the overall lesson here 
isn't really to provide you with a long list or a catalog of rewards and punishments. Nor was this parable given, these illustrations given, so that you draw conclusions about the relationship of slaves to master or disciples to Jesus. It was told to encourage you, to encourage all of you to be ready for his return and to remain faithful at all times and in all circumstances while we wait for his glorious return, while we wait for the glorious return of Jesus Christ. You see, the more we prepare ourselves for that moment, the more we will live our lives with an eternal perspective. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And so, my friends, there's one thing. There's only, if you haven't heard a single thing I, I've said today, this morning, there's, there's one thing I want you to leave here today. It's this. We need to be watchful, alert, and ready for our master's return. We must prepare ourselves by developing an eternal perspective. We must be ready. As faithful servants, we must live every moment of our lives in hopeful anticipation of our Savior's return. Jesus said this in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If this were not so, I would not. If, if, if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. <laughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has promised that he will come back. So we must be prepared. Are you ready? Each person needs to Answer that question. <coughs> Each person needs to answer the question, am I living for today only? With no regard for the master's return and the accounting that he will demand. Knowing what you know now. Now that you've heard this, there's no excuse. You can't come before God. I, God, I didn't know. I didn't hear that message. You'll say, yeah, you did. You were here on this day. You heard it online. You heard it on either SoundCloud or on our iTunes pod, whatever it may be. You heard it. So there's no excuse now. So are you living for today only? Completely oblivious or completely disregarding, I mean, that the master will come back. And he will hold everyone accountable. Are you foolishly putting it out? Are you foolishly putting it out of your mind by thinking, you know what, I've got time. have this the whole life ahead of me. When I'm 90 years old and I've done everything I wanted to do, everything on my bucket list, that's when I'll do it. It's foolishness. 
Jesus says that we should be like men, women also, who are waiting for their master when he returns. So we should live each day with an eye on the future day when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God. We will be blessed. You will be blessed if he finds you ready when he comes. So again, I ask, are you ready? Are you ready for his return? If not, I now want to give you an opportunity to begin preparing yourself. I want to invite you to the cross where your sins, all your sins can be forgiven. You must repent. You must truly repent. You must turn away from those sins. And believe that Jesus died for you. You gotta ask Him for forgiveness. Not because you got caught in sin, but because you truly are sorry that you've sinned. So if you're ready to be forgiven, wherever you're at, Wherever you may be, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. With all sincerity, with all your heart, remember you're speaking to him who was there when the universe was created. With all your heart, Pray this, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. I truly believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I truly now repent of my sins and turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you've prayed that, you've taken the first step in preparing yourself. And you've now become a child of God and now I call you my brother and sister in Christ. There's a celebration in heaven right now. So um, if you'd like to hear about it, reach out to us. Send us an email. Um, send us a message on our, web, on our website. Um, but uh, yeah, we want to hear from you. And also, if you need help in your next steps of your new Christian walk, we can help you with that as well. Um, don't be distracted these next couple months. Take time throughout the day. Sometimes even if it's just a few minutes just to refocus yourself and keep, keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the cross. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Know that all the stuff, all the pressures, all the issues you're having, external, internal, they all are eventually going to go away. Yeah, I know it's horrible going through it, but 
you know, you ought to know that everything eventually passes and one day we're going to pass and we're going to be with the Lord. Glorious in, in, in his kingdom and it's going to be a glorious time. Hope you have a great week. Be safe wherever you're at. Um, be a blessing. Um, share the gospel with your words and actions wherever you may be. May you have a great week. I'll continue to pray for you all. I love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.